Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we would love to hear from you. So send us an email with your question or your comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Today, we have a young, on fire <coughs> Catholic priest named Father Gregory Pine. Now, he is the assistant director for the campus outreach of the Thomistic Institute. Sounds really like a lot, but he's just doing a great Amen. job. You could go to the website, Aquinas101.com, and he's going to talk about everything that they're doing at the Thomistic Institute in ways that you can get connected yeah. to St. Thomas Aquinas, right? Absolutely. And learn, learn <laughs> of his teachings, learn of his ways, and it's, it's really exciting. So we want you to stay tuned and be a part of all that. Yeah. Well, last week I had the opportunity to go to um, one of our work, a symposium that we have here in the state of Alabama for all the pregnancy medical centers. Um, and did you know that in each state, some states have it, some states don't, you could find out how your state could participate. It's called Choose Life America. You can go to the website, it's choose-life.org. Well, what happens with this money? Well, you buy a license plate, pro-life license, pro -life license yeah. plate, and it says Choose Life. You can also have it specialty made if you want to put a special thing on it. Um, and they're yellow. Some have different designs on them, state to state. Our state, in the state of Alabama, we have uh, baby's footprints. Yeah. And um, the beautiful thing is that it's a way to evangelize. It's a way to be a gospel witness to life in this culture of death. And you become a driving billboard. And it's really a wonderful yeah. way for you to be pro-life. A lot of people say, oh, I'm pro-life. Well, what are you doing with your pro-lifeness? What are you doing? This is one simple, easy way to do. Yeah. When you purchase that life tag, it uh, $41 of that tag goes directly to pregnancy medical centers in your state. Right. And so then each uh, year we gather and we get a collection of yeah. that money that, and it goes directly to the pregnancy right. medical center. So each, each center gets so many thousands of dollars for right. the work that they're doing. It's choose-life.org. Find out what's going on in your state. Can you purchase a car tag like this? Are people working towards getting the tags? How can you help them do that? Is your state not doing anything with this? I think Colorado is one of the states, nothing's happening there, right. it doesn't seem. Other states, people have really pushed this forward and uh, they're really meeting some obstacles. Mm -hmm. And so the state is saying, well, you can't have these here. Go to choose-life.org, find out what's going on in your state. Out of sight, out of mind, mm -hmm. in sight, in mind. How many people have we heard that are going to abortion mills? Yes. God, give me a sign, and they see a choose life tag. Yes, and it is a way to evangelize and really defend the culture of life in this culture. We'll be right back with Father Gregory Pine, Aquinas101.com. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and today I'm excited about our guest, Father Gregory Pine. He is the Assistant Director for Campus Outreach with the Thomistic Institute. You can go to the website Aquinas101.com, and today we're going to talk all about it, and you will have a deeper understanding of St. Aquinas and all that this beautiful website is doing to enrich your life that you, too, would become holy and smarter on this great journey that we're on. Well, Father, we want to welcome you to At Home with Jim and Joy, and we're delighted to have you. Now, first, we want you to tell our family a little bit about you and where you were born and your family and how you became this holy man of God. And then tell us about the Thomistic Institute. Sure, gladly. I'm from uh, just outside of Philadelphia, Newtown, Pennsylvania. 
and I'm one of four. And all of us kids went to Franciscan University of Steubenville in Steubenville, Ohio. And while I was there, my sisters gave me the, uh, the sage counsel not to date my first year of college. Mm -hmm. They said, you're going to meet a lot of excellent women. Mm -hmm. Just take a year, don't date, and that way you can make good friends. Uh, and I said, okay, sounds good. Uh, and then during the course of that year, there was a professor who came uh, from St. Louis University. Her name is Eleanor Stump. Uh, and she spoke about Aquinas on the nature of love. Um, and this sounds like a little bit of a nerdy thing to admit, but uh, I just found it especially beautiful mm -hmm. and compelling. And what she described uh, gave expression to things that I had perhaps thought in muddled ways but wanted to say and never really could formulate. Um, and I just found that it was, yeah, it just it resonated with the desires of my heart. So I had to read more about St. Thomas Aquinas. And so I came across this book uh, called The Quiet Light, which is actually like charming historical fiction uh, by Louis DeWall. And I read about St. Thomas and his holiness and the way that he loved the Lord. Uh, and effectively, he introduced me to the Lord in a new way. And I knew that I wanted to uh, love the Lord after the manner in which he himself had. So at the ripe old age of 19, never having yet met a Dominican friar outside of a book, I started like very confidently telling people that I was called to be a Dominican priest. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, and it had, you know, turned out, uh, for which I'm grateful. So I was just ordained just a few years ago. Yeah. Yep. What's interesting, seems like your introduction uh, to St. Thomas Aquinas, and you mentioned this in the back room a bit, really had to do with devotion. Yeah. His devotion, kind of capturing your heart for the Lord, devotion, love. When many of us think of St. Thomas Aquinas, it's kind of his writings, the, the various summas that he's written and other things. But for you, it was like, look, this guy loves the mm. Lord. He understands love. This is making my heart burn mm. for God. Yeah, there's a beautiful little story recounted in that book where he was, for a, a period of a year, his family really didn't want, to become a, want him to become a Dominican, so they uh, tried to prevent him for about a year. And during that time, he would study, read scripture, and memorize it, kind of work on his notes. And his sisters used to come to his room to ask him for life advice. Mm -hmm. And one of them is said to have asked uh, Thomas, how, do, how does one become a saint? To which he is said to have responded, desire it. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that just kind of cut me to the quick, mm -hmm. uh, because we often associate him with being a big brain. But truth be told, he was a big heart as well. Uh, and his theology, as I came to experience it, you know, downstream of that encounter, really encouraged me in my knowledge and love of the Lord. So St. Thomas is, yeah, he is a great saint. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, introduce us more fully to him. Set him in context with world history in the 1200s at some point there and the beginnings of his place of origin. I know it's Naples because my family's from Naples, but <laughs> I don't know too much more about Thomas, but introduce <clears throat> us to him, his education, his life. Sure. So St. Thomas was born right about 1225, and he uh, lived until 1274, and he was born to a wealthy family uh, just outside of Naples. He's from Rocca Secca, and at a young age, his parents had kind of organized or arranged for him to become an influential abbot at the nearby monastery of Monte Cassino. Uh, and so they kind of sent him there in like a boarding school type way. Uh, but then, because of political strife, he had to leave the monastery. He went to the University of Naples to finish up his studies. And it was while he was at Naples that he actually met the Dominican Order. And mind you, the Dominican Order had only been approved in 1216. So he's just like the first generation after St. Dominic. And uh, he found their witness attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he found their, their gospel poverty, the, the quality of their preaching to be very, you know, exciting. And so he resolved to join their ranks, but again, his, his family wasn't too happy about it. They prevented him for a time, but then eventually he went and did his studies and then spent most of his life as a professor of theology. Um, so this is an especially rich time in the church's history because you have the coming together of a lot of different things. So he is able to read a lot of things that his, you know, the people who came immediately before him wouldn't have had access to. Um, and so he's able to bring together this kind of synthesis of theology. Um, so a lot of times I think a lot of folks at home, um, you know, you can like read this interesting thing over here and you know what this holy person said over here and you have a sense of what this saint may have, you know, said, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but, but we have a difficulty saying, how does this all fit together? Mm -hmm. And um, say somebody were to ask you, like, give a talk about the virtue of wisdom. It needs to be 12 minutes long and you need to give it in two minutes. You're like, oh no, <laughs> you know, like, where do I go? To whom do I turn? Uh, St. Thomas is able to impart the kind of vision that's very wise, which sees theology as, as connected because he was reading scripture in a really rich way. He was recovering a lot of things from early church councils, from, from church fathers, and then from 
Jewish thinkers, Islamic thinkers, from pagan thinkers, and bringing them together in this really rich and wise synthesis. So he's just an especially good teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I forget who it was. I think it was um, someone from the 16th century, Cardinal Cajetan, who said he seemed to have inherited the intellect of all. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say he's just like a big disembodied brain, like in a vat, you know, it's like, Ugh. no, it's just to say that, that he internalized these things, he interiorized these things, he made them part of his relationship with the Lord, and he's able to preach about him in such a way that they become an open invitation for us mm -hmm. to know the Lord well and to love him accordingly. Within the church at that time, I mean, it's 1,200 years before to that point and then moving forward, um, there's a lot of ways of gathering truth that he was involved with. Were there conversations at that time in terms of we have the Holy Scriptures, mm. we have divine revelation, why do we need to hear from these other guys and different generations, times, other religions? Um, was, it, oh, was the church always solid in that way? Were there conversations and debates mm. you know, about that? <coughs> philosophy and why do we need philosophy when we have divine revelation? Just share with us about, I guess, the Catholic intellectual tradition. Sure. So at that time, uh, something that was happening, just the generation right before him, was that Aristotle's works, which had been lost for a long time, were beginning to be recovered. So Aristotle, a great famous philosopher from the fourth century BC, uh, was himself the great sage of his day. And his works had kind of gone out of circulation in Christendom, but they had been uh, interpreted or they had been received by um, Islamic philosophers and then translated and then eventually they made their way back to Christendom through Spain and so St. Thomas's teacher St. Albert the Great was one of the first who really got involved <coughs> with these yeah. works and so St. Thomas himself is, is taking them up and he's reading them with great profit but at the time there was a lot of suspicion because some of the things that had been introduced uh, in the Islamic community weren't uh, in accord with Christian teaching and so some of the, you know, like the people at the University of Paris said, like, let's pump the brakes on this. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves and just adopt something without really weighing it or testing it. And so St. Thomas um, kind of fell under a little bit of suspicion because he was open to these things. But it turns out that, you know, he was vindicated and then he was doing it in a responsible way. And I think that because of that, St. Thomas is especially good in our present age for thinking about different theological traditions well. Because I think sometimes we, we have the sense, okay, we have the truth. Um, and we want to unpack the truth and we want to teach the truth. Um, but what about other things that kind of come up in the scientific community or other things that come up in other philosophical or religious traditions? How do we weigh them? How do we interpret them? How do we judge them? And St. Thomas uh, has the sense that, you know, what is truth but when our minds are conformed to what's out there, it's a matter of our being shaped by what is. And if uh, this thing is being said by this person, what really matters is does it does it speak to reality, okay? So God reveals and we have privileged access by revelation, but also our minds can reason on these different, you know, data that we are given and we can do that uh, more or less well. So St. Thomas has a, has a real confidence that reason when healed by grace, when elevated by grace, can be very good at sorting these things out. And so he equips us especially well for doing that same task in the present day. Well, you are just filled with beautiful knowledge and wisdom, <laughs> and we just love it. He but, stole it all from St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> but it's you know, it. this is the beautiful thing about the Catholic Church. There's nothing new under the sun. It's all been said, right? And he, he even said that about his own writings, yeah. right? He just said it's just all straw. You know, like, I'm just going to cease not to write anymore. But the beautiful thing is that now you're in a place where you want to bring this wisdom bring this knowledge and impart it to our culture that isn't being formed by the grace of, of wisdom and knowledge and, and the truth. And so tell us about the Thomistic Institute and all those fabulous videos that you've created. Sure, gladly. So the Thomistic Institute started 11 years ago and it's a research institute of our faculty, our seminary in Washington, D.C. So I'm a Dominican of the province of St. Joseph, which is like New England and the Mid-Atlantic, so Eastern United States. And we do all of our formation in Washington, D.C., right across the street from the Basilica there, the Catholic mm -hmm. University of America. And 11 years ago, it started as a way to host conferences, so bring people together and have them discuss learned topics in theology. 
And then in four years ago, we had the sense, okay, this is really good, and we have this embarrassment of riches. Mm -hmm. How do we make it so that this is more widely available? Right. And so we had the idea to start this campus chapters program where students at secular universities can organize. They can petition the Thomistic Institute to start a chapter, we'll say thumbs up, mm -hmm. and then uh, they get recognition from their campus, from the university, and then they can start you know, uh, hosting speakers who will talk to them about Augustine on grace, or St. Thomas Aquinas on free will, or neuroscience in the soul, or what about evolution, things like that. So things that they're engaging with their faith, they're engaging with different disciplines, be it science, or math, or arts, or literature, uh, but in such a way that it's enriching their formation, which is usually just in one particular vein and doesn't have much to do with mm -hmm. the faith. Mm -hmm. So we show, you know, like in, in doing so, we see that the faith really has this rich intellectual tradition from which we can draw and that actually makes our lives infinitely more delightful mm -hmm. um, because it gives us access to highest truths and it helps mm -hmm. us to sort out our own disciplines wisely. Mm -hmm. And so the students themselves are the protagonists of the work and they're really energetic about it, which is awesome. Um, and they wanted to be better kind of intellectual evangelists to their peers. And so they said, what if you had some kind of program which helped you know, take people by the hand and walk them through the thought of Aquinas? Mm -hmm. Because this, this tradition is big, it's vast, yes. but it can also be super intimidating, mm -hmm. especially when the first time you encounter Aquinas is in this like intro philosophy course your freshman year, and you just put them next to a bunch of modern philosophers and expect people to comprehend, and it's tough. Mm -hmm. um, so what Aquinas 101 is, is that it's a, a series of like 85 to 90 videos. They're gonna be rolling out two a week over the course mm -hmm. of the next few months. Um, and each video is, it, it'll instruct you in some small piece of St. Thomas's philosophy and then his theology. And the videos are given by different Dominican friars of our province who teach at our faculty. Um, and they're all accompanied by little course listening that we have curated for the purpose and some readings to kind of get you into Aquinas slowly mm -hmm. without it becoming super intimidating when you're assigned like 60 pages in one go. Right. So just, just small selections to get you a sense for the vocabulary and the concepts and the style. Uh, and then as it, as it progresses you along, you'll have a sense for the whole thing. So that way, when you look at the Christian intellectual tradition, you won't just see like an eye and an ear and a mouth, but you'll see the face mm -hmm. and how it fits in context and how glorious it is as designed. Mm -hmm. oh, beautiful. I, I've signed up, even though I'm not a college student, <laughs> and I did get back right away um, happiness from the Summa Theologica. Yeah. And so I guess it's kind of a condensed version and some commentary. Yeah. So St. Thomas is great to that. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, thank you for sharing with us. We look forward to having you back on Friday to unpack more fully this tradition and how it's impacting our country and the world. We'll be right back. We're going to take a break at this point. There's plenty more to come. I think we'll have Father Wade Menezes with yes, us. Yes, we will. Don't go away. Well, today we have a special guest priest who's joining us, Father Wade Menezes, and we're so happy to have him. He's with the Fathers of Mercies, and he was in town. So we decided we would have him stop by and join us on At Home. But before we speak with Father Wade, let's check in with Catherine Hadro, who is the host of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Now, Catherine, what's on the pro-life agenda for this week? Hi, Jim and Joy. Well, as usual, we have so much to talk about this week. We are going to speak with Representative Ron Estes of Kansas about the latest pro-life news from the Protect Life Rule to the Born Alive Bill. We're always tracking the latest pro-life news, which brings me to my weekly call to action reminder each and every week. If you go to ProLifeWeekly.com, you from home can take a pro-life action and make a difference in our movement. We update the call to action each week. All you need to do is go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Also in this week's show, we will introduce you to Human Life International. This group is profoundly Catholic and boldly speaks out against contraception and protecting life from conception to natural death all over the globe. Be sure to tune in. You can catch all of this and more on EWTM Pro-Life Weekly Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern and again on Sunday at 10 a.m. I hope to see you all there. But for now, back to you at home. Catherine, thanks so much. Thanks for equipping God's people to do the work 
of the ministry. Father Wade, wonderful to see your face. No stranger to EW10 and at home with Jim and Joy. Well, it's great to be back with both of you. It's been a little bit of time since yeah. I've been on the set, but it's great to be with you today. Yeah, what do you think of the conversation today and kind of for many people rediscovering or discovering for the first time, Aquinas so steeped in our tradition. Many of us know him well, but so many more don't. I think that it proves that truth is perennial. Mm -hmm. And as one priest told me one time years ago when I was still a brother, he said, beside the three-legged stool of sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium that is safeguarded by the deposit of faith, the fifth greatest gift to the church is St. Thomas Aquinas's scholasticism. Mm -hmm. His beautiful merging of the philosophy and the theology and providing a synthesis for human thought regarding everyday affairs, three that come to mind just right off the bat, things like human sexuality, um, political civility, mm -hmm. uh, immigration. Thomas would have something to say about all of these areas applied to the here and now as we enter into this third millennium, 19 years in. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his truth, his synthesis is right there. Um, you know, before we study for the priesthood, we study philosophy first, followed by theology. Then once ordained, whether we a religious order priest like myself or Father Gregory, or a diocesan priest, there's then thirdly, the pastoral application. Mm -hmm. So philosophy, theology, pastoral application. And I marvel at God's goodness looking at the three most recent popes. We had John Paul II, the great philosopher. Yeah. Not that he wasn't a theologian, of course mm -hmm. he was. Followed by Benedict, the great theologian. Not that he wasn't a philosopher, he was. And now we have the, the pastoral application of Pope Francis. Again, a synthesis of the teachings of the faith um, greatly applied through the truth given to us by God that's always applicable in modern times because of the works of such great saints as Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. one of the great doctors of the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. So key, you know, they have a phrase that they use with this Thomistic Institute, and I don't know if I'm saying it right or not, but I think of it uh, in this way, you know, that thinking matters. Yeah, yeah. Not only in terms of the weight it, it matters, it's so important, but it will materialize. Right, right. And if we're thinking wrongly, if we're thinking just subjectively or relativistically or, you know, emotionally, that's right. it's going to show up. Mm -hmm. That's right. But uh, human secularism, uh, relativism, uh, the passions, emotions, and feelings being unruly and, and running wild when they're meant to be ordered, they're meant mm -hmm. to be harnessed in a, in a healthy, joyful way so that the individual human person can live their life fully yeah. as they're meant to live it. Yeah. Um, are, are important tenets to living just that, a good human life. And so when you see uh, the freshness of, of institutes like what Father Gregory was, was talking about, which we'll talk about again in the next episode more in detail, uh, and to think that all of this is being geared towards young people yeah. on secular college yeah. campuses uh, is just a wonderful thing mm -hmm. in, in a day and age where the culture can be toxic in its certain elements. And, yeah. and we as Catholic Christians uh, bearing the fullness of truth, uh, living our baptism, living our confirmation, uh, sustained by regular Eucharist and, and regular reconciliation, whether one be married or single, um, to embrace that truth and to want to help prosper it and foster it through the great works of such institutes. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, you know, it's that scripture verse where it says, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are true, think on these things yeah. that yeah. our mind would be formed. And then we as Catholics, we have to yield. Yeah, that's right. Lord, think through my mind today yeah. that I, I wouldn't be left to me because it's not a mind, a good mind. Yeah. And what you think on, then you act on. Right. Yeah, that's right. And so it's really important how we temper ourselves to be refreshed and cleansed in the truth and the grace. Yeah, and, and we're a body-soul composite. Uh, Thomas would say that, that we don't have bodies, we are bodies. Mm -hmm. And we don't have souls, we are souls. That's how intimate and intricate the body-soul compositeness is in the human person made in God's image and likeness. So both need to be fed. Mm -hmm. the, the soul with the spiritual aspect and living of man and the body with the temporal, physical living aspect of man. And both are meant to be harmonious. They're not, there's not meant to be a dichotomy between body and spirit. Um, and so we need to live in such a way that both are fed. 
Father, please close us with a blessing. Certainly. Heavenly Father, through your Son and the Holy Spirit, we ask you to bless all of us this day. Uh, bless all of us, especially our viewers. Uh, help us to continue to fight the good and beautiful and joyful fight for the faith. We ask all these good things through Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, Jim and Joy, and Amen. all of our viewers this day. We ask this through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Another great contribution here on EWTN, learning about Aquinas 101. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.